Next speaker, um, Arthur Orsini is the creative director of Urban Thinkers in Vancouver, Canada. He leads his field, or rather he is his field, so far in, in, anyway, in offering resources, training, and support for engaging youth in transport decisions. He's been invited to give presentations and trainings in this field of youth engagement across Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. His work employs uh, creative strategies for student leaders to, among other things, engage their peers in active school travel programs. In fact, after leaving Dunedin, um, he will be working in, Auck with, uh, in Auckland for Auckland Transport for a, a little while. Uh, he's won international awards and facilitated international youth forums. Um, along with the AMHC, Arthur and I have been working together uh, recently on such a project here in Dunedin with a group of non-driving youth of driving age. Uh, to our knowledge, um, no one's asking non-drivers how they think and how they feel about their transport options and decisions. Uh, the aim of our project is to create a sustainable culture of discussion surrounding mobility issues that are generated, strengthened, and propagated by the teenagers themselves. So after his presentation, Arthur is going to continue um, with our last symposium speakers of the day, which are the participants of our program here in Dunedin, um, in an unscripted panel discussion. And you will all get to hear firsthand what some teenagers from Otago have to say about how transport options and decisions affect them. Arthur lives in a four bike, zero car household, and he has never owned a car. We are so happy that he's here. Please welcome Arthur Orsini. Thank you. I'm the last non-Kiwi speaker of the morning, and uh, I'm also a transition between the doctors of research, the PhDs, and the high school students. That's where I fit in. Uh, I just want to point out that it's no longer OK to list your uh, phone number in, and uh, email address as contact information. So that's who I am, and that's, that's what I'm doing. Uh, I want to dwell for a little while on the title because uh, a title such as Engaging Teens in Healthy Transport Decisions could look like a very cohesive title, but in my mind it's very expansive and actually I'm going to spend a lot of my time, which I should take note of, uh, just expanding on that and getting a sense of it. So what I want us to do is get a sense of this idea that each of us has an independent thought bubble above our head, which we do not know. We can try to understand it. So I would like to hear three questions about what engaging teens in healthy transport decisions is meaning to you, and we'll try to address it. And if I can't address it today, I'll find ways of digging up some resources and blogging it over the next few days. Engaging teens in healthy transport decisions. Yes, please. It's a question of motivation. Is there any indication, certainly the adults are all pointing fingers and say teenagers should be interested in these issues. Are teenagers themselves motivated and interested to ask those questions? Thanks. Another question? <coughs> um, the social cost of being seen on a bicycle, I think, I, uh, when I've heard you talk previously, um, you've talked a <coughs> lot about that um, concept. I wonder if you could tell us um, a little bit about how that influences um, decisions in terms of healthy transport. I'm going to actually clarify that. It's the, as articulated by one of the students I worked with years ago, it's how to lower the social risk of being seen on a bicycle, not the cost, the social risk. Yeah? Yes. The previous speaker gave us the idea that education doesn't do it, they've got to be monitored. What can we do in schools? Okay. Okay, so I'm not going to address those now, but wherever they fit in, great. And wherever they don't fit in, uh, I'll be putting in a blog. My new favorite thing is writing up about all these things in my very opinionated point of view. Uh, it's one of those contact pieces. So, engaging teens in healthy transport decisions. Well, the word in gets off, but everywhere, each of the other words has a lot of meaning to it. So let's, let's see what I mean. Starting from the end, decisions. So as far as I can see, decisions implies options. So what options are realistic and available, and I mean really an option. Um, that includes time, cost, what are 
what are our peers thinking? What are teens empowered to make? What are they prepared to make? And what's preventing them from making the healthy th decisions? And you know, are all options equally valuable or presented equally? So in terms of decisions. Well, here's an image I took in Auckland of a high school student deciding to jaywalk. And I hope you notice this is a very complicated road system. It's within a, two blocks of a high school. It's on a hill, accelerating traffic. It's merging at a Y-shaped intersection. There's two lanes of oncoming traffic separated by median, which I guess is lucky for him. Uh, so the idea that this is the decision that a person's making, and there's many factors. Now, just in the course of a few days of being in Dunedin, uh, I've had to make a lot of those same choices where I'm crossing a path that leads across a busy road and there is no crosswalk. And I'm on a hill and I'm not gonna go that far up the hill to crosswalk or that far down the hill to crosswalk. The first time I made this crossing, I was very cautious. And I was waiting for the opportune time. Maybe it's because it's driving on the other side. But my point was that after a few days, I was going much faster. I was not waiting for that big buffer, big safety buffer. And so looking back at the student crossing Linfield uh, Road in Auckland, the idea of habitual use is, is something that makes you more familiar and maybe more likely to take chances. And that's a part of where the decision making comes in. In terms of transport, well, of course we have modes, walking, cycling, public transport, cars, car use. In terms of what are the options, what are the access, do you live in a place that has public transport? Um, what are the costs? Is it free? Does mom and dad pay for it? Is it free, but you have to do the dishes? What is the cost of using transport and the different variations of it? And what are the expectations? If you have a free ride to work from mom or dad on the way there, uh, do you have foot pants? footpaths or what's the quality of that crosswalks, all of those elements. Uh, I will add that um, I don't have a car. I have two teenage children, a uh, 17-year-old and 18-year-old. Neither has their license. And we haven't, aren't stopping them from it, but we don't have a car, so there's very little motivation for them to do that. But interestingly, none of their friends have their license. And it's not because their parents live without a car. It's just a matter of the part of the town that we live in. So it is a part, but your transport decisions, there are so many options that if we didn't have options, they may have moved much quicker to get their driver's license. So I've got a few examples of where I might say my colleagues, the adults, the municipal planners, the transportation engineers, the school district officials have said that they have been engaging peers in uh, healthy transportation decisions. So here's an example of someone who says, yes, we have accounted for pedestrian infrastructure at our school. There's a crosswalk through the drop-off zone. I don't know how familiar you are with drop-off zones, but they are chaotic and people don't follow the rules. Yes, we have a continuous footpath that leads to the front door, but it is not along the desire. Now, I want to show you one good example. I mean, here's a place where you can actually walk towards the school without going through the drop-off zone. It can be done. This hardly looks like they had a ton of researchers putting together this design. It can be done. Yes, we have bike racks. It did take us, this is in suburban Montreal, it took us a long time to find these bike racks. And then again, we were thinking, are these bike racks? Or are these part of the you know, North American, American football gridiron practicing ranks. They are bike racks. Now these, this person, this school might say ours are far better and they're being used, but can anyone tell me what's not great about these bike racks? Not Sorry? Not oh, well, you hit the jackpot, but I'm going for something even much more simpler than that. They're not being used properly because you can't fit your bike in there to lock both the wheel and the frame. So you have to lean it sideways in order to access the frame and the wheel to a piece of metal. Which means that where there could have been six or eight bikes, you have one. And it means that there's no one on the other side can project their wheel through. Enough said. It's not a good bike rack. But the school will say, we have covered it. And people are using it. Enough said. Arthur, please go to another school. Here's an image. Actually, this is from a student here, but what I saw this, you know, I have a Canadian accent, here's in New Zealand, so there's these things that I call accident, accidental accents. And when I see this and I think of cycling on this, I think of this as a cycle path, 
for psychopath. <laughs> but, but if I'm a cyclist and I lived and I had to cross through this, I would have to take you know, very serious risks. Is there any comment that can be made about this? Um, this is taken on State Highway. It leads to a main shipping port for our region. This is the only possible way we can use active transport to get into the city through this. So on this side of the road, it's probably maybe that wide. And on that other side of the road, you've got about that much space before you're in the middle of the traffic. And I'm 17. And in 17 years, the as of next month, they're finally actually building a cycleway along the railway line. The other option from this is to walk on the railway tracks next to the harbour on a main trunk line for New Zealand. Thanks. So that's a local reference to this. I love this photograph for all the wrong reasons. This is a high school in suburban Vancouver, uh, 2,000 students. Yes, we are serviced by public transport. Do you have a question? <laughs> I don't know why I have it in black and white, but you can see in the distant back left, there is a institutional type building. It is a high school. I'm not going to name it, but there's 2,000 students. This is the bike rack, uh, sorry, the bus stop. You can see the, the quality of the footpath, or as we say, sidewalk. Uh, I did say Vancouver, which gets rain. There is no rain shelter here. So how do you lower the social risk of being seen as a loser standing at that bus stop while anyone else goes by in any other means or in their parents' car or in their own car? Just so you get another picture of this, this is from the school looking back towards that bus stop, where that bus stop is. So you can't even see it from there. But the people will say, we are served by public transport. So we come to the term healthy, engaging teens in healthy transport decisions. But what does that mean? Are we talking about fitness, about active transportation? Is it about safety? Is it about clean air? I mean, is the environment a part of this? If it is about road safety, does that mean about vehicle safety? And so but what about cycling safety, which in itself is a, a diverse topic, which includes bike maintenance, knowing how to fix your bike and keep it in good working order, knowing how to choose a safe route that's comfortable and also safe in terms of where you need to go, what are your alternatives, but also basic on-road training. So is that what we're talking about when it says he healthy? Um, how many phys ed programs offer cycling training? How many times do we teach um, road safety pedestrian t skills to t younger children so that the, by the time they are teenagers, they have internalized some very healthy uh, road safety habits. And then in terms of health, you've also got the aspect of bullying. I'm not going to go into that, but my point is that the word healthy is not one word. It is a diverse area of subjects. So let's look at a little bit of this. Here we have a really wide road. This is a different part of Vancouver. 30 kilometers an hour per school day. It's two lanes, but they're trying to get it to one before this crosswalk. There's a lot of infra engineering infrastructure in to make in, put in to make it healthy. So let's pull back from this image. There it is. You see the, see the fence? The fence says that the students on the, at the high school on the right, where the door is mid-block, and they want to go to the dairy, or as we'd call it, convenience store on the left. Um, they've been jaywalking. and so. We not, we're trying to low, lower traffic speeds. Mm, it's not quite working. So let's put a fence and s say that they can't walk through it. I'm not saying that's wrong, but it is very indicative of how to engage high school students in a local traffic dilemma within the area. And if you didn't think that was funny, this is the front door. <laughs> this is the front door. I hate to say it. Does anyone rec oh. I shouldn't ask. This is the front door on International Walk to School Day. <laughs> because for the event, we needed to bring muesli bars and juice and so on and so on. And they had to come in a van, and that's where it is. I really do like my job, but I just have a hard time being not cynical. Teens. I mean, there's, that is one word that is so diverse. You can't just say teens, engaging teens, and say, oh, yes, OK, we have one way of dealing with that. So who are the teens that you're talking about? The ones who are already involved, the ones who show up, the ones who are 
already been in road collisions and need extra attention. The ones who are in their early teenage years, the ones who are in their late teenage years, the ones who are already driving. Um, the, what are the characteristics of the teenagers? The, the quiet ones, the shy ones, English as a second language. Is it male or female? Ethnicity, race, a decile rating, or the economic background? What part of the city are they in? Are they rural or urban or suburban? All of that fits under within the word teens. So I'm hoping you're getting a sense of this title I was given with is so complex that it really needs to be assessed before I can even get to my talk, if, if I get to my talk after defining what it's supposed to be. So here's some photographs of a, a group of sad students. Now sad means there's two Ds. Students against drink driving, or as in North America, students against drunk driving. They were really excited, and they were, they were great. But what had just happened was uh, during the roadside check, looking for drunk drivers, um, they recognized a chronic car thief, and a chase took place. Unfortunately for all of these girls, the hot cop, the very good looking hot cop, had to go off on that chase, and, and he was the topic of conversation. So there's many ways of motivating and engaging uh, teenagers in this. But this is just one group who've self-selected to be in the SAD department, SAD group. So what about, what about your average teen that's already on the bus? How do you engage that person? What about your average cyclist who's not necessarily doing this out of activism, but you know, they're, they're already there? And we have some students here. So people who are invited and, and come and actually show up. Rocky, you'll show up in a later picture, sorry. <laughs> So not only that, uh, the different topics that are the themes that we're, are going to come up there. So part of what we're doing in this, in this project that follows up with this is talking about different topics. So sort of under the banana category, how, how safe do you feel be, being a passenger, which is also part of the banana of personal feelings about not driving, and the corn is the environmental, et cetera, et cetera. That, we'll come to that. Finally, the biggest word of them all is engaging. So what does that mean? Is it speaking? Is it listening? Is it having research that includes teenagers? And does it include listening? Um, what I really love about what's happening here in Otago with this project is that we're incorporating the element of time. So you could give out a questionnaire or have an online survey. That's a one-off interaction. You could have a workshop that spans a couple of hours. Um, but what is really impressive about this is that the, these teenagers here are, they, they are signed up for continuous interaction, which means you can have a conversation today, but next month, if you resume that conversation, there's extra insight. There's things that you don't even think about that come up when you're subconscious. You'll be more observant of what's happening with your peers and what's going on at home. And that element of recurring time and coming back to a topic over the course of the 2012 school year is uh, what I think of as very engaging. So what have we got next? <laughs> so, part, well, I'm gonna get to it more for the panel, but when you're, enga when you're engaging people of any target audience, you really can't know where it's going. And so you need to re leave space for what they're interested in. And this comes back to that question of motivation and the social el elements of it and how can schools be involved. So I have two pictures here from a group that I worked with in a Vancouver school that wanted to do a ironic photo um, series about cars. So this is We Love Our Cars. And I can't remember what the title of that one was. So it was basic photographic irony number two. Point being that you need to find out in you need to allow this to explore itself in, in ways that are diverse and match the audience. It may not look like you're specifically addressing what your funders have asked you to do, but it is a part of a process that is engaging. You can have workshops. You can have visioning exercises. One of my favorites is to give out a, the front page of a local paper. So in Auckland, it was the New Zealand Herald, and ask students to describe what would be of no that the local paper would cover that they've done. And it's part of visioning to get a sense of where it is they're headed. Fun events such as cycling, um, art events such as creating uh, bike rack signs that with partnership with the different few other areas had them actually put up on bikes, uh, bike racks. I do want to make note that this is an environmental message. 
image. I, I've never seen, well, I won't use the word never. I haven't seen environment as the behavior change catalyst. It is easy to identify, it's the cherry on top, but it can't be the uh, driving force of behavior change. When you're engaging young people, you gotta be prepared for levels of activism. This is a mild form of activism that was part of a winter solstice um, march about how during the long parts of the day, people are at greater risk for being on a bike or a pedestrian. So too many dead pedestrians. Sometimes activism gets a little bit more bold. This is with the youth group, so this is not part of a school. Uh, this is in my neighborhood and we had a meeting out on the street, which was called a parker, parking meter meeting. Um, I didn't get the idea, I heard it from somewhere else, from Hamilton, Ontario. Just so you know, if you ever do this, it's hard to see, but there's a plant. There's a couple of plants out there so that you create a little bit of a buffer zone between yourself and the traffic because of course you need to make sure everyone's on board and is, is going to be safe about this. There's no clowning around. Uh, all the attention is faced in on the sidewalk. Just by coincidence, um, to give you an example of what's, what happened, two police cars passed by. I was kind of nervous. Nothing happened. Buses passed by. They honked. And, uh, even though there was money left on the parking meter, there were people that asked if they wanted um, to contribute. They were willing to rent our meeting space. In fact, if you're looking for cheap rental space <laughs> in the downtown area, you will not find anything cheaper than that. And I must point out, this is about 10 years ago, nine years ago, that's my son who, my children accompanied me down a lot of my work. And uh, this also took place in Wellington as a bit of a media element for the um, Sir Peter Blake Environmental Youth Forum. Okay, I think I'm ready to start my talk, but not yet. Because we have a phrase, engaging teens in healthy transport decisions, but that phrase does not have a subject. If you just look at it grammatically, there's no subject to that sentence. We start with the word, with, with the verb. What is the subject in, core, in terms of engaging teens in healthy transportation decisions? As in, who? Have you been listening? <laughs> <laughs> Who is engaging teens in healthy transport decisions? According to Arthur. Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, but no. Okay. My job is to train and support teenage leaders who then engage teens in healthy transport decisions. And that's what I'm all about. And that's what this is about because what you're doing will inform what will happen down the road. So I want to talk about, well, first of all, it's a big task. So they need some support. And I'm going to talk, uh, this happens to me all the time. Thank you. I got a little bit of time left. Uh, three, three, three scenarios for this. First of all, offering opportunities. Second is offering training. And third is strategic support. So you're not just a cheerleader, you got some strategic way of making this happen. First element I want to talk about is a youth forum that took place in Toronto 2007 as part of Walk 21 conference. The idea was that we got a youth group to facilitate a one day global youth forum. Well, you can't really put up a posting saying, we're looking for teenagers who've already hosted international forums, please apply. So we had to find people who were interested in it and train and support them so that they could facilitate the day. It was fantastic. So what was the best thing that came out of it? According to the, um, according to the about 120 participants that attended it, it was the confidence. Seeing a group of teenagers, well, I'm out of sync with myself, but the keynote speaker was chosen and the, the submissions, the review, the shortlisting, the interview was all done by the youth leaders themselves and David Godry, who was 18 years old at the time, gave a fantastic keynote speech. My favorite line to the teenagers in the room, do not give away your power to make change. So inspiring and so, and he, he had talked about solar powers that he had got installed in his Toronto high school. Uh, the student leaders themselves facilitated the day and the presentations were done by other youth leaders and there were some other workshops done by people who are in the profession, but the, oh, the whole morning was done and led by teenagers. 
In terms of training, basically, I've been working on this type of work for, for like since the 90s. And when I try to look back, I'm, I'm not an academic, so when I look back on what I did, this is how I've described it. And this is sort of the model for uh, the workshops I give when people ask, so how do you do what you do? I want to look in just at a short element of this with two things in mind. So zooming in on that, first of all, that purple at the start, which actually looks like an arrow, it doesn't look like anything else that it shouldn't look like. <laughs> it is not starting at the bottom. It's starting at the top. You're never, and I, I don't like to use the word ever or never, but this time, you're never starting from nothing. People have intelligence and experience that they bring to the table, even if they're as young as nine years old, which is the youngest I've worked with as student leaders. The next is that as you recruit people and get them involved in this, it's all exciting initially, and then you might realize we're trying to battle the car culture. Oh my God, this is a daunting task. And motivation can dwindle and come out of it. And the way that I like to envision it coming back out and what I've seen almost every time is that, the, as the yellow suggests, it's skill building. So as if to say to the group, if nothing else, if we are gonna completely fail in our goal of reducing car use to the school, what can you get out of this? Maybe you want to be able to create a video. Maybe you want to um, do some public speaking. Maybe you want to build a company, whatever. That's part of what takes us out of that doldrums of, my God, how are we ever going to change this? The last part of this, I think I'm in time, is sometimes I feel like I really need to look at the research and see what else is going on to help inform this. So there's this theory called the theory of triadic influence. I'm not going to try to explain it, but it exists and Amy knows much more about it than I do. So let's just zoom in on something that I've referred to as attitudes, perceptions, and capabilities. So in terms of, and this is to talk about strategically helping uh, an engaged group succeed in what they're aiming for. So, when it comes to the attitude of makes me feel good, I do whatever it is because it makes me feel good. You want to think of why would someone change their behavior? If it already feels good, why would you help want them to change the behavior? And so the idea is that you try to make other, better, healthier, whatever, whatever, benefits more visible and more salient. So this was their independence campaign that we had in one of the schools. Well, actually, we've done it several times. Cyclists don't ask their parents for best fare. And this actually touches upon what Paul Tranter said in terms of um, the work about Carl Arnway and hurry up. It removes that pressure, that, that element of flexibility. Because you might think the car equals freedom. But if you have to have the car back by 6 o'clock because mom has a meeting tonight, then the car isn't as, much, as, as free as the bike or the bus. Um, and also, it removes the whole idea of trip limits. You know, if you're on a bike, your parents aren't going to say, uh, I need the bike home by 6 o'clock. So there's elements of independence that affects the attitude. And if you're trying to change attitude, there's ways to do it. So other ones we had were cyclist parents don't nag, hurry up, we're going to be late. Uh, and then other ones, walking to school is about the only time each day I have get a bit of time to myself. The next element of it is everyone else is doing it. So why would, how would you change behavior when everyone else is doing it? Well, first of all, you, is everyone else doing it? Maybe the, maybe the perception isn't accurate. And so here is something, and I'm going to try to be really fast with this, but 80% of teenagers said in one study that they would listen if a friend said their driving made them feel uncomfortable. Other things you can do is make the behavior visible. If you don't think anyone's cycling, well, all it takes is a bike mechanic in the front end of a high school to make it look somewhat more visually uh, recognizable, and though you will have some already there. The last element that I wanted to mention is the third part, the capabilities. Could I do that? Hey, I, I could do that, sweet ass. So, if that's the problem, if that's what's stopping is people don't know because cycling is dangerous or we don't even know who can cycle, well, what you can do is find ways to make this happen, and that's through group bike rides and uh, mapping exercises that help inform where this is headed. Speaking of which, this is headed to the next step. We're going to skip questions for Arthur at this point and table them until the very end so that he can continue with the teenage panel. I'll, I'll just turn it over to Arthur.
Thank you, Arthur. Oh. Yeah, we have. So panel up, please. Panel up. Okay. Still me. So, as as has been alluded to, I'm going to give a, ca uh, a context for what's happening with the panel. Uh, it's about it's about youth engagement, and there's two elements that I believe are a part of youth engagement, and that is that. What did I say? Whoever shows up are the right people. And uh, whoever continues to show up are the right people. No, nope, thanks. Uh, and the second part of it is that the facilitator is not in control. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is that it's really difficult. Well, they're not in control because you don't know where, where it's heading. Uh, you can invite people to participate, but until you get a sense of the character and the conditions and the circumstances, you just don't really know where it is heading. Which means it's very easy, thank you. It's very easy to um, write a report about a youth engagement project because you just sort of look back at what's happened and you just sort of say, this is what we did and this is why we diverged from what we had said. But it means that writing the proposal is very difficult. Because if it is true engagement, and you have not met these people yet, you don't really know where their passions or their interests or their skills are going to take you. So with that in mind, it requires a lot of trust from the funder, from the supervisor, but from the participants. So thank you very much for all the trust you've shown in this, because you didn't know where you were going, and um, we barely did too. So thank you for that. Um, last part is that there, as I said in my, in my um, er earlier talk, there's a lot of ways you can en engage youth, but this has an element of time, and so this is the beginning. This is an early element of how we are going to engage, and there will be more that follows um, throughout the school year. So this is the beginning side of it. We're going to get a sense of what's on your mind and how you respond to basic questions. This is not prayer prep prepped. It's the beginning of the school year, so we have only been meeting for a very short time. And I guess with that in mind, we should begin. So right here, we've got Vincent, Craig, Sarah, Rocky. What I'm going to ask you to do is briefly introduce yourself and say something a little bit about how you came to be here and how you came to be here repeatedly or again. <laughs> Why you didn't leave? Well, I'm Vincent. I'm 17. I live fairly far out of that Port Chalmers, so it's about 10 k away. So public transport and transport is something that fairly majorly affects how I sort of how I get to places, obviously, um, how I act socially, and what I do with my spare time. I was involved because Mr. Turner, who was sitting in the audience, he rang and said, right, do you want to do this? And I said, yes, I talked too much already. So now I'm here. And they also gave us food to be here. So that's always a really good motivator. Thanks. All right, well, I'm Craig, and I live out in Moscow, which is about 15 minutes away from Dunedin on the motorway. Um, and public transport there isn't very good. Buses are one to one and a half hours apart. Um, I came to be here because, again, Mr. Turner called me during the holidays and asked if I'd like to come. And I thought that I would come because I thought perhaps I could make a difference, uh, as idealistic and naive as that is. Um, so, yeah. Um, my name's Sarah and I'm 16. And I live out in Wakawa. And it's, again, really hard to get into town because it's half an hour drive. And buses are, yeah, don't go out very often. And I got a V here because our teacher, Mr. Jenkins, rang me in the holidays. And I thought, well, you know, it'd be a good experience. And yeah. <laughs> My name's Rocky, and I'm 16. I live in Palmerston, which is 45 minutes out of Dunedin. And again, same transportation with Wacker White. It's not very good, not very often. So you end up relying a lot on your parents because I don't have my licence. And I got introduced to the IMPACT project by my teacher, Mr Jenkins, who gave me a call on the holidays and asked me if I wanted to be a part of it. And I thought it sounded like...
a really interesting thing to be a part of because there's not a lot of things that really involve teenagers. So I gave it a go for the first meeting and it was actually really fun and Arthur and Amy are so good, like they're so nice. And I don't regret coming at all too because it's been interesting and I've learned a lot and I definitely think it's something that should be looked further into. Hearing how these people were invited uh, reminds me of the statistic I have from Nova Scotia, which is on the east coast of Canada, and it said so, something like to young people, why don't you get involved in uh, um, civic initiatives and school initiatives that are non-sports but are reaching out more? And the number one answer, which was 49% of all the responses was, I've never been asked. Mm -hmm. And so this represents a, a direct initiative by the university with the department making contact with the teacher and making an invitation, a personal invitation, and the results are pretty cool, pretty great. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to begin. We've got some time to, to talk and then have questions, but we've asked each person to tell a little bit about some circumstance, either themselves or a friend, in terms of uh, transport issues. Are you ready? Yep. So, being someone who lives fairly far out of the city, obviously I rely on transport. I said that two seconds ago. Let's hope your memories aren't like that. Um, for example, one night, a couple of months ago, we all decided we'd go ice skating. Now, the ice skating rink is a long way that way. To keep it simple, they, it's in basically the middle of nowhere. And we finished ice skating at 11.30 at night, and I went to read the bus timetable. And the bus timetable consisted of a whole lot of numbers with a whole lot of arrows pointing to different stops and all sorts of absolute rubbish. And I didn't understand a word of it. So I decided to walk. And we walked in a group, and we started walking towards the bus. And as I was walking, I realized that we're not, like, it's not anything personal against these people, but the part of town we were walking through wasn't probably the safest area to be. And as we started walking, I realized that I'm not gonna make the bus. There was only one bus at 11 o'clock at night to get home, so I ended up ringing a taxi, flagging taxi to the bus stop, and taking the bus to get home. And I rang the taxi, got on the taxi, thought, oh, thank God, I'm gonna make it. So taxi took me to the bus stop, I got on the bus, and I sat down and I could see two people who were drinking the aisle over, some lady who seemed to be in her own little universe talking rubbish. The driver seemed a little bit dodgy too. <laughs> so by the time I got home it was about midnight and I was walking up the hill and I thought if I was driving and I'd gone for my license I wouldn't be in this position at all. I would have I could have driven home, been home straight away. I wouldn't have had an issue whatsoever but like you look at the photo that Arthur showed before. The road that I live on is dangerous and a lot of the people I know personally have their license and the thought of them being on the same road as me scares the living crap out of me. They are some incredibly irresponsible people who believe, I have my license, I can go anywhere. I'm bulletproof and I should be on the road. Everyone get the hell out of the way because I'm coming through. That photo that we saw earlier of the road, that narrow stretch road, there is no fatalities on that piece of road and the fact that I could be potentially driving along there with someone who decides to do a quick overtake and smash his head first kind of scares me a little bit. Um, a good example of that is a, a student who went to Logan Park High School and he drove a high powered car. He decided one day he would go out with his friends so he hopped in his car, drove, he drove just past the stadium just down the road from here, went through the roundabout, went up the road and he came behind a logging truck going to the port and he thought oh well you know truck I'll just overtake. He floored it, went past, another truck came, his car was crushed and he wasn't recognisable as a result of that. And that's an example of the sort of risks that anyone who drives on a road has to deal with. And I wouldn't, like, it's nothing personal, but I don't know anyone here. I know them, we've met, but I don't know any of them well enough to know what decision they're going to make in any given situation. And I don't know, so I choose, if you look at a random person, you realize, I've never met you before, I don't know what you're going to do, and I don't want to rely on what you're going to do because I don't know what's happening. I don't want to start driving and suddenly find that you have decided, oh, I'll just overtake, or you're going to suddenly turn without indicating, which Dunedin's horrible for. If you've ever noticed that, people never indicate. Anyway, you, I, have, I don't want to be on the road with someone who could be incredibly unpredictable or who believe they have the right of way to everything. So I take public transport, and it's risky. It affects me in that I, I have to rely on the buses to be out. On Sundays, we have three buses. 
to get to and from the city, despite having, we have the port and all that, and that's all we rely on. That's the only way I can, so I don't catch up with friends on the weekend, I just play Crash Bandicoot on the week on PlayStation, which is a good game. So my main focus, I always rely on public transport, and it has its caveats, it has its benefits, but I think it's something that there's not a lot of input on, and it's something that needs to sort of be focused on a lot more. Arthur touched on educational cycling in schools. Um, my primary school, that we were in sort of a little, I don't know how you describe it, a little township just out of Dunedin. And we used to have a wheels day. We'd come to school. The local police would come down. They'd do bike checks and that sort of thing. But we'd never learn how to actually cycle safely. So you'd learn if you're crossing the road, look one way, look the other, look the other way again and cross. But you wouldn't be taught, like, if you're on a bike, that you have to give way if the give way sign says it. And... We weren't taught sort of basic road safety, simply that bikes are fun, come to school on a bike. So the education is there, but it's not as in-depth as I don't think it needs to be. So that's me. Thanks. Um, with that, with public transport, in a lot of towns like where me and Sarah live, it's not really an option because we uh, the bus services aren't very often. And in the weekend, there isn't a bus through Palmerston at all. So if it was anything like I wanted to get a job here in Dunedin, I just couldn't because it wouldn't be an option after school. Because the bus, the last bus from Palmerston into Dunedin is at 5.30. You get like two hours max at work and then you'd have to be back. And that's if there's a bus to take you back to Palmerston. And yeah, it's just not an option for a lot of teens in New Zealand who live in smaller towns. That's like with going to town and like wanting to hang out and go to parties with your friends as well. You yeah. can't. Exactly, because, you know, you can take the 5.30 bus in, but then you can't get back out, so you're kind of stuck. So. I mean, to add to that, I find myself often relying on my parents because the public transport system simply isn't very good on the weekends. And it's a huge burden for them, especially when they're doing things like they have to do extra work on the weekends or moving business studios and that kind of thing. I'm going to... I want to ask you a question that we hadn't covered before, unprompted. Uh, in, uh, in Canada, in the, well, Canada, United States, the Iroquois First Nation is a matriarchal society. Where am I going with this? It makes sense. Um, which means that the men are the chiefs, this is going back historically, the men are the chiefs, but the chiefs are selected by the women. In fact, they're selected by the grandmothers. The reason for that is when the little boys are playing as toddlers and young boys, they see how people interact. And so they can tell, oh, he, he, he's never going to be the chief. He's grabby and won't share and whichever. So my question to you with that in mind is, of all of your peers at school, how are you able to just recognize how they play basketball, how they interact in the cafeteria? Are there any indicators of people that you, of what you said, Vincent, you would say, I think that person is going to be a safe driver. I think I'd be OK with getting in a car with that person. Any indicators that you can share? Um, I can think of an individual. I'll call him Nick. It's a simple name. Um, Nick is spoiled. His parents will give him anything. He drives an Impreza, which is a sports car, not overly powerful, but um, still pretty powerful. He believes he is entitled to the world, and he is incredibly arrogant. He is incredibly focused on his own thoughts and no one else's. And he he doesn't, he believes he is above everyone. He is the demigod. He is everything. The way he acts around school, as it is, is like really concerning. He doesn't socialize with other people. Everything is about him. And if you put him into a car, and I know he does driving, he has his full license now. When he was on, oh, side note, when he was on his restricted, conditions you're not allowed to carry passengers but he'd go driving every night and take friends out driving and that sort of thing and he would never give way or anything like that at intersections and you look at how he behaves at school and that in itself is concerning but putting him in a car when other people can have control of a situation but he doesn't recognize that is seriously disturbing. Nick do you have anything to add to that? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> So, thanks. And to any, same question. 
Well, you can tell how people are, um, well, not always, but with quite a lot of people, you can tell how they'll be with other things just by the things they do do. Like, you, you're not going to be able to tell with everyone, especially people you don't know well or people you're not around often. But just by the people, just by the way people act, like if they're irresponsible or responsible, you can tell how they'll treat other things in life, not just driving. So yeah, you can get a good, I don't know, trust of someone just by how they act in general things. But like saying that, like I know quite a few guys at school, and like one of them, he's like nice and all, but then like you put him in a car and he's only got his restricted, and he'll have like seven other people in the car with him or something and then like the way he acts and the way and there's another guy and he acts kind of exactly the same but you hear all the stories about him and he sober drives and all that he's got his full he's you know real so like you know you can sometimes judge people by like what they do at school and stuff and how they act but most people change quite a lot when they get behind the wheel so and there was a slide that showed that, where when teenagers were driving with their parents, they were excellent drivers, safe drivers, yeah. and then they weren't. Mm. Anything to add, Kurt? No. <laughs> OK, uh, I want, I'll ask one other question. Um, there was a quote earlier, much earlier, I don't know if you were all here for it, but it was from a hockey legend, Wayne Gretzky, and it's, it basically was, it ain't where the puck is, it's where the puck needs to be. Meaning, let's not just focus on what's here now, but what needs to be. So for Dunedin, is there anything that Dunedin needs to have that would make your lives better, easier, more comfortable, more accessible? Because there are people here from Dunedin who can't necessarily do what you're dreaming of, but they can take note of it. Buses can run more, yes. like with less time in between because you'll like, need to go somewhere real quick, but then and you don't have a car, but then the bus won't leave for like, another two hours or something. So. Yeah, more frequent services. Also services that are sort of like express services and that they won't run through areas which you think, why does the bus go through here? That's so far off the route. Because some buses go through the strangest of places to get where you're going, and so as a consequence, they can take up 45 minutes to an hour to get from one place to another, whereas in a car you might take 15 minutes to get to. Um, I'm not a cyclist myself, but I think the biggest thing I notice in Dunedin, especially watching other traffic and other people who are on the road, is there's no cycle lanes. There's cycle lanes on the motorway and on the one ways north and the one way south in Anzac Ave, but there otherwise people will ride on the road and I'm not definitely not targeting cyclists, but cyclists seem to sort of if they see a gap in the traffic, they'll go for it, or something like that. And they don't have their own space. They're sharing it with things that are like a couple of hundred times more solid than them. And you can see that accidents are going to happen because cyclists are taken note of, or taken note of in Dunedin as a whole. If you go to Christchurch, you see a lot of cyclones in Dunedin. They ride in the footpath or get hit by traffic. <laughs> If, if there was cycling training offered at Phys Ed, would you take it? Like good cycle training, not just look right, um, look right. Well, I live on, our school's on a hill, so no. Um, <laughs> I think I would. I, I, it's not exactly practical for me to ride to and from school, but I can ride to Port Chalmers, I can go to the shop or the dairy or scouts or whatever. Um, I could use that, but I don't have the confidence on a bike around some of the track that takes that highway to ride a bike at all. I wouldn't ride that highway at all, not a show. I myself wouldn't because um, Palmerston isn't a really big town so you can just walk around it, but it's not like I'd ever bike from Palmerston to Dunedin, that would be extremely exhausting. So there wouldn't be much point in having a cycle training for Z at just such a small town really. Yeah, that's the same here. Like, I can't exactly bike to school. You know, it's a 15 minute drive from where I live to get to school, but, and plus I don't have a bike, but, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I probably wouldn't take it. I, I just wouldn't cycle, learn to cycle full stop. I'm not a big fan of riding on something that is uh, bits of metal with two wheels. <laughs> I, I'm not a great fan of riding on something like that, no. Cool.
Uh, we've got time, and the hope was that there would be conversation and questions from the audience, so there we are. Have you all actively chosen not to drive? Like, has it just not happened yet, or do you not see yourself driving in the future? Um, for me, I chose not to drive because it is really expensive. Like, just getting your licence costs, you know, heaps, and then if you fail it, you've got to pay more to re-go for it. And then plus, like, getting a car is heaps and paying for the petrol and all that. But I probably will, I probably will eventually get it because, you know, hanging out with friends and stuff, you kind of need it. So, yeah. Um, I haven't got my licence, as strange as this seems, because I would like to wait until I've got my pilot's licence so I get my driver's licence. <laughs> It, 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 it seems silly, but it, to me it would just seem so much cooler to have gotten my licence to fly an aeroplane before I've got a licence to drive a car. <laughs> as silly as it seems. It's also pretty easy just to like take off from Moscow and land on Stuart Street. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but then I'd promptly get my licence revoked. Yeah. Um, and to, I don't really plan on getting my licence. I might when I start university. Depends on when my lectures are and if they match the buses and that sort of thing. But. I don't really see any purpose. We, ha we have public transport and we can use it. And if we don't use it, we're going to lose it. So you have to make use of it because if it's not used, they'll get rid of it. So it's easy to use that when it's there. And I'm not an environmentalist, but it is a lot more environmentally friendly to stick everyone on a bus as opposed to having all the cars. So I don't really intend on getting my licence anytime soon, although my parents don't like that. Well, um, I don't have my licence also like Sarah because it just costs too much for me to do it. But um, I will have to get my licence because the buses will cost too much. Like um, after year 13 and I'll either be in uni or I'll probably get a job in Dunedin. Um, I found out the other day from my brother who's taking a course in Dunedin that the the cost for funding it is $1,000 a year and that only covers three months of the travel from Palmerston to Dunedin and back every day. So I will, yeah, I'll be forced to get my licence after year 13 because it's just not something you can live without in a rural area, yeah. Question for Vincent. Um, I, I couldn't help but resonate with the comments you were making about the hypothetical Nick and remembering when I was at your stage in, in high school. And <laughs> one of the really frustrating things for me was that you could spot these yahoos at a distance. They behave abominably. They're really awful people as a rule. And yet they are inevitably among the most popular in the school. And I'm wondering if you see that phenomenon too. And as you, you, Arthur's engaging you to be student leaders and to influence your peers and colleagues. And if you're not part of that sort of social clique, which I definitely wasn't when I was in high school, it, you end up being classified as a borderline geek. And really, your ability to influence your peers um, is limited. And it's the guys like Nick who get all the attention. I just wonder how you, you deal with that. Um, this particular student, I think, it's not, he, he used to get attention, but it's the point where people are so sick of his arrogance that we don't talk to him anymore. He, for the time he drove people around on the restricted at school, so we live, out, well our school is in a place up on the hill, it's not in the centre of the city, but we win a lot out of school uh, during school hours, but the fact he is restricted means he can just park outside and run everyone down to Subway or Makers or BK for lunch, something like that. And that was what made him popular, the fact he could drive awfully, but the fact he could drive and people could take advantage of that was something that seriously benefited him socially. But I think since then people sort of realise he's so in his own little independent world that he's not someone you want to be associated with, full stop. I'll just, um, can I add to that? I know who you're talking about for Nick. Um, he is, <laughs> <laughs> he is not the most popular guy, but there is still that culture in the school, like you can see in the popular group that there is that attitude of, there is still the arrogance and the popularity and you can tell that they're not going to be responsible. And you can see that more year level wide than that at the start of the year a student came up to me and said, right, five dollars, and I said, what for? And she said, we're getting everyone in the form to put five dollars in, and I said, well that's a hundred people, that's five hundred dollars, and she said, what for? And she said, oh, it's for a stereo. And I said, I don't agree to this. So they went out and they bought the stereo themselves and 
they play the most god awful music you have <laughs> ever heard. It's terrible. And they got this huge 300 watt stereo that sits in the common room, and the mentality is they bought it, and they are, so we're not allowed to touch it. We don't have input on what's played, and it is oh, it's terrible. <laughs> You can't study your focus, but because they are the cool group and they are the superiors, they're the only ones who get to control the stereo. And they, it, it shows that those who are, believe they're above everyone are the ones who seem to make the decisions and exclude everyone else. Bit off topic, but you know. Life tends to correct that as you get older. <laughs> yeah, the, one, the ones who don't try at school are the ones who end up working for those who did try. Thanks. Yes. I wondered what the panel's understanding was of um, the process by which they can influence decision makers in terms of spending priorities. So do, do you, as young people, know how you go about that in the, uh, through the democratic process? So are you asking like, how we can influence decisions made in the city regarding That's correct, this? yep. So, for instance, you've, you've given the example of public transport. Now, what's your understanding, for instance, of who are the decision makers that make decisions about public transport in the Otago region? Um, well, I know that this bus service is in Dunedin and run by a company called GoBus, which is part of our regional council. A couple of times I rang about the bus because, of course, we have the shipping port we get the cruise ships in. So we have buses that are so packed. We have sirens going off on the bus for saying there's too many people and... We have times where school students are told they can't catch the bus because the tourists have to use it. As and I've tried to ring, I've rung the council. This is something that really gets to me, obviously. I've rung the council and they've said, ring this person, I'll ring that person, they'll put me on someone else, and they'll put me on someone else. It's very difficult to find someone who's accountable for that specific service or for public transport as a whole. There's no ultimate way you can contact someone except ring the person in the bus timetable brochure and that they might put you on someone else. There's no accountability or any particular individual who is the contact person, if that makes sense. I mean, if I may, I don't think that the Otago Regional Council wants to listen to us because they just want to cover their own... They want to cover their asses, pardon the language, um, and they just want to protect themselves so that they can keep on making money. And to be honest, like, we can who listens to us kind of thing. Yeah. They don't want to hear from us, they just want to keep making money, handing out the contracts to the people who they want to hand them out to, and they don't give a flying about the public. <laughs> they used to be Nick. <laughs> yeah, and like, um as an individual, like if you called in, it's not going to make much difference because it's just a complaint, but like with us as a group as a whole, that's when it starts making a difference, when you start trying to change things, which is why I like, really like the idea of this impact project. It's good. <laughs> can I turn it back to you? Is yeah, there... I, I would absolutely say to you people, young people, you can make a difference. You've got to believe for a start that you can make a difference. Um, you've got to be well informed, um, use really good arguments in terms of thinking about the things that um, decision makers are motivated and influenced um, about. You may not be of the age yet where you can vote and so you um, have, a, have a part to play in electing those decision makers. But there are processes like the annual plan process, for instance, within um, the Dunedin City Council and the Regional Council also has a similar process where you can influence um, their spending decisions. And so basically you, you have to be able to say, right, I'm going to have a voice in this process, and that means that you can write submissions, you can turn up and say that you want to speak to your submission. Um, as a staff member, for instance, that works within the Dean City Council, we um, absolutely can lobby on your behalf too, but you ultimately have the power um, as uh, citizens or residents of the city um, to have your say, and the more of you that do that, and the louder you speak, the better and, and um, more chance you have of being heard and, and decision makers um, doing what you want them to. That's the theme of our third term in engagement, so thanks for that. Um, there will be questions at the end, but we're, we've got four other people to switch over to. So let's thank uh, Darren, Craig, Sarah, and Rocky. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, Rocky. Run. Your photo was on the slide. It didn't get to. Sorry. <laughs> That's what I'm down. Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm not going to introduce what we're going to do again because we're resuming. Um, we had conversations that began before. You can choose to discuss or answer any of the other questions, but we're going to begin again with who are you, why are you here, why did you show up again, and how were you approached, et cetera. So we'll start. Darren? Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Darren, I'm 17, and I'm a non-driver by choice. Has nothing to do with the fact that I failed the test. <laughs> um, and yeah, because of, I live about 45 minute walk away from my school, so if I have time I like to use that, so, but if not I'll use public transport or parents, so I use lots of different transport options. And um, I'm involved in this symposium because Mrs. Turner called me up on the holidays and I thought it sounded like a good idea. Thanks. I'm Zoe and I'm 16 and non-driver and I found out about this from Mr Turner as well. I got an email on the holidays and I thought it would be something interesting to take part of and hopefully make a difference. Um, I'm Clara and I'm 17 and I'm also a non-driver and I got called up in the holidays and I wasn't too sure what it will be about but when we got there and we heard about how would be able to say our own opinions about it. I was really excited about it. And so it's been a good experience. I'm um, Ben. I got phoned by Mr. Turner as well. <laughs> and when I heard it was a non-driving teen symposium, I didn't even know what the word symposium was, so I looked it up. <laughs> and I thought, why not? Because that's me. I, I must have something to say. And we've all got thoughts and opinions on it, so I thought, yeah, I'll go for it. Cool, thanks. I'm going to ask you, before I ask you to tell stories, I'm going to give you a um, quote from something that was said earlier and ask you to make, say your thoughts on it. And you can just lead into a story if you want to from there. Um, and now I'm forgetting where I wrote the, this down, but my car is not for transport, it's the image. Is that yours, Paul? My car is not for transport, it's the image. So if you're not a driver, what's your image? in terms of yourself and your friends and your school and your peers? I think people, like, in a way, I think that was, was talked about a little bit before, with the cycling, it's quite socially not accepted in a way. Like, if you're cycling and then someone in a car comes up, you feel quite embarrassed about it, and so, I think having a car, I suppose, is quite, like, it makes you cooler in a way. Not that I have a car, just, yeah. so Can I say, I actually um, disagree with that. I quite like to cycle. And um, the only people I feel that judge me for that are the um, Nicks and um, <laughs> just popular people at school, not people I want to be friends with, so it doesn't bother me too much. I think it does bother the necks, um, if that's what we're calling them. Um, they were, I have a nut, it's not neck, I don't actually know who Nick is, but let's, Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm friends with him on Facebook and he kept putting photos of his car up in different colours, saying, which one do you like, guys, you know? <laughs> Vote, so it's all about the colour and the style and all that, and he kept photoshopping different colours onto the car. And no one cares but him. So that's all about just colour and all that with him, with Jeffrey. <laughs> well, I can understand where Clara was coming from, that the car being a better image than a bike, just because if you see them stopped at a red light, the car's just more common to see, so you can kind of blend in a bit more. Instead of the bike, you stand out, because just from what I've seen, I see more people driving cars than bikes. And, and I'll say that when I've worked at 
youth groups in other cities where there are more cyclists, then that image of you as a cyclist can have a much more positive social element to it because there are more people. It's not such a minority. Um, so we're going to return to that whole format of let's hear that hear a story that might spark up some conversation and discussion. Would you begin, Ben? Yes. Thanks. Um, my theme is parental impact on teens that don't drive. And my parents have never practiced to get that old comment around the sofa saying, oh, your brother needs to be picked up. Are you going to go get him? Oh, no. You don't have your license. <laughs> And I go, yeah, I don't. <laughs> but it's not, it's said in a jokey way. It's not said in a, like a malicious way because they know I don't have it. <laughs> um, but you still feel guilty because you don't have it. And I'm 17 and I could have got it when I was 15 so I could have gone through it all and had my full by now. But I don't. Um, but you get a little comment every month from them saying, you know, are you gonna get it? And I said, yeah, I will, but I haven't. <laughs> um, and they definitely recommend it because it's easier to get around, not just for me helping them out, but for me helping myself out, getting to friends' houses and getting to school and things like that. And also I have another story about parental impact. Uh, a few years ago, I was in a musical at school and we were rehearsing and um, that we'd been told by the directors it was six o'clock to eight o'clock sharp. And so my mum turned up at eight o'clock and there was loads and loads of parents around and um, we still didn't come out till about 20 past eight. And um, so all these parents were parked, a lot of them illegally, in these bus stops, which um, were school bus stops. So you, it said you could park there, just not in like between 8.30 and nine and three and 3.30. And then we saw this parking warden on his little moped sitting in another bus stop, writing down everyone's registration plates, which was outrageous. Because then the next day, all these parents got $40 fines in the mail. And so that's you know, parental impact as well, because time, you're not coming out on time. And yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Um... So I'm going to talk about what I think about public transport. And so one of the issues about not having a licence is that you do have to rely on public transport. You can't... I come from a big family, so there's seven of us kids and both of my parents work. And so they're often not available to take us where we want to go. And so, yeah, I use public transport a lot. But I'm... I'm quite nervous about taking public transport because it can be quite dangerous. I've, like, I've heard quite a few stories where people have been harassed on the bus and stuff. So like one of my friends was on the bus one time and there was a young girl there and it was just her and that girl and then a group of teenage boys got on and they all sat around her and they wouldn't leave her alone. Like it was obvious that she didn't want them with her but nobody intervened. And even the bus driver, he just kept going. And so it makes me wonder like, how far that kind of thing would have to go before someone would step in. And so it's quite scary to think that you're not actually safe taking public transport. <laughs> I could add to that. You know, we were talking about before with um, what we wanted to add to Dunedin, and we talked about that, and I thought about bus drivers. And because um, 90% of them like uh, just won't look you in the eye, won't talk to you, they just go, buddy, and um, <laughs> that's that. And I don't understand that because I don't understand how the interview process works because <laughs> they're, you know, they're working with the public, so why aren't they treated as like, you know, like a checkout chick or something like that? They're just they're horrible people and they won't step in. <laughs> so that's not nice. I'm going to throw in that before I left Vancouver, my wife and I went out for Valentine's Day. It was, we don't have a car, so we're on the bus, and we were going to take the bus home. It's kind of rainy. And she was kind of like irritated because my kids say we would have a car if she wasn't married to me. But she's kind of irritated. We get on the bus, it's packed, it stinks because people are wet. And the driver said, Welcome to Flight 99, and we're on our way to Commercial Drive Station. And it was very charming. And within moments, she was like completely transformed, and she wasn't complaining about anything about it. 
So we do some, have some really good customer service drivers. You should encourage it. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, well, I'm just going to talk about economic impacts that can cost a lot of money, especially when you first go for your licence, you have to pay for that and there's a chance that you might not get it, so you have to pay again and try again. And then once you have it, it involves more costs of getting a car and paying for petrol and insurance. <coughs> and so I find that public transport can be a cheaper option, but not always as reliable because you can miss the bus or can come earlier or later, and so then you rely on your parents and sometimes they're all preoccupied, so you can miss out on things because you can't get a ride. Did you be in? Uh, no, be in. Oh. <laughs> OK. You all look the same to me. <laughs> Teenagers. <laughs> um, was one of the topics that um, interested me the most is the um, pressure to drive, so you have the parental pressure which probably has the biggest impact on me because um, I have younger siblings and my parents are busy and they need to be picked up sometimes but my parents want me to do it and um, but I don't actually like the pressure because I don't trust myself driving because you hear about some of the teenagers that you think are responsible and then they crash and everyone's like, it's just, I wouldn't trust myself. And I've actually been driving with one of my friends who I thought was rather responsible. I found out as I was getting out of the car that he had his restricted licence, so I thought he had his full, but um, yeah, there were two passengers in the car and the other guy was a bit irresponsible telling him to do stuff and he just did a little bit of speeding and uh, just not the most responsible guy driving. So, so I just ignore the pressure because when it comes down to it, it's my own feelings about driving and I don't trust myself, so I'm not gonna go for my license. And, and you're not alone. And, and on that, I wanna ask one other item quick and then we'll go to the floor, or yes I do. Because you mentioned Facebook, so I'm, my question is social media, if you are trained and supported teens who are engaging other peers, what's the role of social media in any of this promotion and insight and discussion? And then we've got questions. You mean talking about what we're doing here? Yeah, about how this is prog going to progress throughout 2012. I don't know. <laughs> what color should the bike be? Uh, no, you've lost me there. <laughs> Hit and miss. Uh, well, I just like to say, social media, you can say anything to anyone and anybody can respond. So we could post on Facebook and get everybody else's opinions to bring along to this as well. Because as much as we don't like them, it could be good to get the opinions of Nick and, <laughs> was it Jeffrey? <laughs> So, should we go for a question? No, that is a good idea. I understand your question now. Um, <laughs> it is a good idea because you can make, you can create an event and say, let's all bike to school today or something like that. So, yeah, no, it is a good way of moving this forward. And, of course, there are high schools in Vancouver and Melbourne and Auckland and elsewhere where you can tap into it too. Yeah. So, questions from back here? Yes? Hi, I'm from Canada and I've been living in Vancouver for about the past four weeks now. And I've noticed a lot of motor scooters around the area. I'm not sure what the regulations are in terms of licensing, but have any of you thought of using or going to use motor scooters instead of cycling? I think um, if you get your learners, you can use them, a scooter. So that'd probably that'd be a good option. But I think they're also not that safe because you're out like in the open, like you're on a bike, but you go quite a bit faster. And so I'm not sure that I would get a scooter just because of the danger factor. That was always my plan <laughs> to, um, just because you can, get a, you can get your learners and then suddenly you're by yourself. Whereas a car, you have to have someone with you that entire time. But yeah, I'll rethink that. 
Uh, to be, he was saying that you can get learners in Australia. Well, you learn this as a theory test. You have no, you've never been in a car before. Yeah. You've never been actually taught the dynamics of anything to do with driving. You can sit a paper test and you can immediately drive by yourself on the road in a moped. So having less experience on a more dangerous vehicle, not the greatest idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, a scooter is actually really easy to drive. I've driven one and I think it's yeah, no, I don't have my licence, but it was on the farm, so it's OK. Um, <laughs> but um, for, like, with me, I couldn't really have a scooter. And, yeah, it'd be good to not have to have supervision all the time. You could just ride down to school or to work or whatever. But to get to town, you couldn't go over the Kilmog on a scooter. Eh? You, <laughs> it, it'd kill you, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Are you guys unusual? Or are most of your peer group driving already? I think it's about 50-50 at the moment mm -hmm. at our school. Most of my friends do drive. And yeah, I'm about the one-off. Most of mine don't. I know some people that have got their learners but haven't really done anything about it. Like, they've got it but they haven't really learned how to drive or they don't have someone that can teach them. See, I'm the same. I have a close group of friends of about 10 and of that I think two have licence, one learner, one restricted, so no one's really, <coughs> there's not much peer pressure from close friends to... Um, I'm from Canada as well and I see your highways are very different here, but um, in terms of like safety issues and you've talked a lot about like public transit and you showed pictures about where bus stops are. I know this past summer um, in the city that I live in, there's a bus stop on the other side of a six lane highway and then there's a three lane roundabout that you have to cross through to get to the school. Um, and, and what ended up happening is a public transit bus couldn't see because they were too high and ended up killing um, a female girl because they crashed into this girl. Do you find that there's a lot of safety issues and that's the only way you're gonna be able to make change for the public transit systems? Or like there has to be an accident for it to happen? Do you understand? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, accidents definitely get more attention, but if people are determined there are it is possible to change without accidents happening. I have seen changes made in the past, not quite, not drastic changes, but subtle, helpful little things. I'm from Hawke's Bay, and there's this bridge between Havelock and Hastings, and it was tiny, and so many people were going through trying to get a cycle lane and a footpath built onto it, like. This happens so often and there were people kind of, not rallying, but you know, whatever, for it to happen. And they only decided to put one in when this, um, sorry, I knew he was like 14, he got hit by a um, truck. And that was when they were like, hey, we need one. So a death, it had to happen. And there's another roundabout that the same thing happened. Everyone was trying to get something to happen because it was really dangerous and there were crashes, but, sorry, sorry, I know these people, but, kind of, but um, and it didn't happen until she died. And like, it could have been prevented, so it's kind of shit. I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. Oh, gosh, tough I, I want to speak to that in terms of different types of activities we've done with the students where their, their engagement process and their activities and events are really diverse. And I hear that, and I know that there have been groups that would have come up with this idea immediately, so I'm thinking like them, is that you just stage a mock death as if it would happen. It would, if something is happening at this intersection where it's been very dangerous in, along your road or at some point in Dunedin, is that you could fake the death and have the funeral and sort of have the fake outcry, not fake, mock outcry, rather than waiting for that death. That's what I've seen empowered youth groups do. No. So, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm 25, I'm also from Canada, and I also don't have my license, but I'm also not in a rush to get it, because I have, we have, in St. Catharines where I live, I have good access to public transit, I can walk, and my parents are pretty good about me. I mean, I've been asked by relatives as a joke, so you're gonna get your <coughs> license sometime, but I don't have younger siblings to drive around, and I'm comfortable not driving. Thanks. 
Is this something your teachers talk to you about at school? Like, if you if you wanted to talk about this at school, is there a venue or an opportunity to, or other, you know, or if, if you wanted to get this talked about, is there a, is there a means for you to do that, or is the curriculum so set that you can't kind of introduce stuff? I think they think we were going off topic. I like, <laughs> asked about that in class, so not really, unless you asked about it after class, maybe. And you wouldn't know which teacher to go to, because yeah. we never talk about that kind of stuff. So. But it does bring in things about local government and advocacy and a whole lot of stuff. You think, you know, someone might be interested. Yeah. Maybe no one's asked them. <laughs> you know, that's what you said before. Um, with that in my school, um, we don't have anything really set, like, ever to do with travel or transport or anything like that. But I think it wouldn't be too hard. Like, if I went to the principal, I could probably get up in assembly and talk about, like, this whole thing. And I think that would actually, like, have a big impact on some people, like, what they do with their driving and things like that. Like, it is something that can be talked about, but it will have to be the students, like, people involved with this sort of thing or people who just have understandings about this to have it brought into schools. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. You've mentioned how you don't trust other teenage drivers on the road and you don't trust people, you don't trust yourselves, like falling to peer pressure. But what do you think about more funding being put towards education about driving? Instead of pushing for more money being put into transit and public transport, what are your thoughts on, you know, putting more, putting more money into extending the education that you guys are being given. Would that make a difference to how you felt about driving and being on the road? Um, as far as trusting other teenage drivers on the road, I don't think more education would help because like the stats and the statistics in the presentation before showed, as soon as the teenagers were alone in the car, their risk went up, their safety went down, it's um, their mindset, I believe. So things like defensive driving courses, you don't think that that has any impact on the way that people... I don't think so. They are responsible drivers. It's um, the way they think and the way that they act, so it's not how much they know. I can't disagree with that because I've done defensive driving and before I went in I thought I was bulletproof and then actually doing defensive driving and seeing accidents and seeing how they happened, it does give you a whole new view on driving. And I reckon like things like what do you think about if putting the age up so you can't drive by yourself until you're older so you're theoretically you're more responsible. Would you agree would you be safe think it's driving is safer then? Um that does sound like a good idea. That, um, um, can I say that, that um I reckon if they put the age up like any more, <coughs> then they're gonna have a lot more trouble with people just driving before. Like I reckon like people just start driving more without their licence at all because they're not old enough to get it. So they'll want to go out more, like the same as they do now, and they won't be old enough to get the licence so they'll just go out anyway, sort of thing. But they'll get to a point where they won't know, I guess, any better. <coughs> so once it's already been through a few years, they wouldn't have mm. even tried driving, so they wouldn't have access to be able to drive. It'll be, there will be that, like I think, period where there will be that mesh of people who would have got their licence next year, but now I can't get it for like another three years, so they'll want to drive. But then it'll be that next generation coming through who've never had the opportunity to get it at a younger age, so they, well, they don't know any better. Yeah. So I think there's kind of that thing as well. Can I, like, super quickly add, um, when we were in year 10, we did a program called Drive to Survive, where we were taken to the Edgar Centre and shown a mock car crash. We were shown what would be done to a dead body. We were shown how an IV was put in. We staged a funeral and we were told a story of several youth who killed several children in a car crash. This person, Nick, he said, oh, don't know if I want to get restricted anymore. Two weeks later, no impact, he's out driving again. It scared the hell out of a lot of people, but people forget it. It disappeared from their memories. I think that drive to survive thing was actually really good. I, we did go to that, our yeah. school. It does have an impact, 
but it is one of the sort of things that face the back of your mind, like, I forgot I went to it until he mentioned it. <laughs> um, but with the defensive driving, she does have a point, it really does give you a good respect perspective on it. It is a good thing to do, but it isn't mandatory, and I think maybe it should be. I don't think the age should be changed, because there are people at our age, at 16 and even 15 year olds, who don't have any other choice of transport but to be driving, and it is something we need. So I think that um, defensive driving should be made mandatory. It's part of what you should have to do before you get your restricted, I think. Because it just gives you a better view on how to be responsible on the road. Uh, we can't take any more questions just because of time. I, I'd like to thank all of the youth in the panel for not only for today's work, but for signing up, continuing, and demonstrating tremendous insight. I mean, if you read any of my blogs, I'm just sort of like crazy about how fantastic and how willing and intelligent we've seen develop in a very short sort of time. Thank you to all the panelists. Stay there, right, stay there. Right. And the last thing I'm going to do is welcome back Dr. Weiss to close out this symposium, or wrap it up. Thank you, Arthur. It's going to be a, a very quick wrap up. Thanks to the students, our, uh, our speakers today. We've covered a lot of ground, uh, and I think there's still a lot of ground to cover. Uh, there's one comment I would make as a wrap up. There's a famous person who I can't remember the name of, I think, who said, You can measure uh, the health of a society best by the way they treat their children. And I really detect an undercurrent here, an undercurrent of uh, sadness maybe an undercurrent of uh, frustration, that maybe we're not treating our young people as well as we should. And maybe that's a message that the ORC and the DCC and the voters and the people of this region uh, ought to think about, but it is important that they hear about that from you, as, as we heard. So again, thank you. Uh, this is a beginning. I'd like to hear from uh, each of you individually at the break, uh, at, at the meal, about what you thought. I do want to give you a little sneak preview for what we're thinking about for next year, and that's to move uh, even more towards solutions. We didn't talk about that too much today because it's so early in understanding what's already been done and what might be done, but uh, Amy and I, and uh, with the support of our advisory board, will be thinking about solutions and which directions to go to begin to, to make some of the changes that I think we heard about today that we need to start doing. So again, thank you. And to our virtual audience, thank you for joining us. And hopefully, we'll see you again next year.